Okay, so now we come full circle again. It's important to keep covering the topic over and over because there's so many angles to it and every time you revisit the same ideas with the nuances, you see more. But for all that, it really still boils down to when you get up in the morning, why do you do that? The only reason I can justify living is due to him. All my problems are due to him. All my happinesses are due to him. Anything I manage to get done is due to him. And it, that's not s simply the factual matter of, you know, we're all dependent on God. My motive for wanting to do anything, my motive for wanting to run away from him is to run away from him. All my motives, all my thought pattern, all my... everything in my head revolves around him, awake or asleep. And that's due to the fact that, like any other Christian, I've just been living and lear learning and living on Bible for so long. Now, in your case, it might be different in the sense that you might not need as much time to get to the same place that I am now. I'm the kind of person who has to... I'm not content to just do something because I'm told to do it. I have to understand it. Primarily because I, I don't know, if I don't know what it means, I don't know how to obey whatever command I'm given. A lot of other people, they prefer it the opposite way. Just tell them what to do and they'll do it. And they don't really care why or what it means. I've just never been able to really function that way. It's not that I've never done it that way if somebody tells me what to do. But I, I can't wrap my head around the order. And if somebody says, go do this, I can't just memorize whatever I'm supposed to do and then do it. I have to understand what I'm doing and then I'm thinking about the steps in order to obey. That's what it's always been. And maybe you're not that way. Maybe you, you know, you can look at instructions or hear instructions and you like it that way. It's one, two, three, four, five. And you get a great sense of accomplishment when you do it. I can't work that way. So what that ends up meaning is that for me to get to where I'm at now spiritually might be a longer period of time than it will be for you. Okay. Um... Maybe it's faster. I'm really not sure where I'm at. I mean, spiritually, in terms of the knowledge itself, yes, I'm mature. And at the far end of the mature spectrum, you know, very far advanced. But in the in carrying out what I know, I, I give myself a flunking grade. Really, I can't. You know, I'm not really sure what a passing grade is because the knowledge is really crushing. It's really hard to get through a day knowing what I know. And I'm not sure how that compares to what it ought to be. Now you're going to have to make the same sort of judgment call about yourself, but at all points, from the minute you get up to whatever problem you have, whether you're running away from God currently at that moment, or you're running to Him and you're, you know, in a pas de deux, you know, you're dancing, you're in the spirit, and you're going along with what you know his will is. In all of those instances, just like in any intimate relationship, um, the decision is constantly, do you want God or not? That's really the whole story from the get-go. The first minute you believe in Christ to the last second you draw breath on this earth, do you want God or not? So long as... It's about God to you and not about ego and all that other stuff. That other stuff will always be in a mix. But I mean the motive that really drives you. Is it about knowing God better, seeing God better, just because? That will speed your growth the most. 
that will get you through this the most. And that's really the heart of the trial. All these other things that we've been going through, some of them have been very sophisticated, some have been very obvious. Those are all the spokes of the hub. The hub is, do you want God or not? Everything else is following through from that. Satan wanted God and then he got upset with what he thought he discovered about God. And primarily the, the tension in the relationship between God's superiority and Satan's own inferiority and what he thought righteousness ought to mean. He split with God over that. And in order to make himself feel comfortable splitting with God, because, you know, that's just as bad as parasite, he had to make God out to be the bad guy. And he's been convincing himself of that ever since. In his mind, it's not so much that God's the bad guy, but God's flawed. Satan actually thinks he's, he's doing God a favor. You have to understand how Satan's mentality works to really get this. It's much more nuanced a story than, you know, people typically think. Yes, Satan's the enemy of God, and all the things we, you know, we say are true, but there's more to the story than that. It's not a black and white situation. Satan really admires Jesus Christ. You can tell that in the way he talks to him in Matthew 4. He, he's really hurt that God has not seen things his way. You can tell that in his arguments in Job 1 and 2. He gets really ticked off. When Satan says skin for skin, he's, he's lost it. He lost his cool there. Okay? He's speaking out of anger. Well, anger is always what you use to mask hurt. The hurt is underneath the anger. Especially for a male type. A male personality. Okay? So Satan's hurt. He doesn't understand why God doesn't see it his way. And so he's, he's basically telling himself that he's saving God and the, and the angels and Christ and the whole human race by his quixotic quest to win in the trial. That's why it's gone on so long. That's why Satan hasn't given up till now. Now, a lot of believers have written me emails and stuff like that. Well, you know, if Satan already knows from the Bible like we do, why doesn't he give up? He, give, he doesn't give up because he thinks he can win. He thinks God is just wrong. Either incorrect or ma malevolent. And he sort of varies between the two. But he really thinks of himself as the proper savior. And he really thinks that he'd even be saving God. So... That's why it's so important to, to, to anchor yourself periodically through the day or however you like to do it. Why am I living? Why do I get up in the morning? What do I really want out of life? And you'll notice that's coming full circle back to the same question you had when you first believed in Christ. It's coming full circle back to yourself. And there's so much talk in Christianity. Love your fellow man. You should love God. You should be selfless. La di la. Well, hello, you're a human being like everybody else. And in fact, if you don't know why you want a thing, then your motives aren't grounded. And, you know, to be honest with you, this is where I have the most problem. What does brain out want? I'm not comfortable saying it that way. I'm not comfortable thinking about what do I want? Because my whole life it's always been about God or somebody else. And I actually don't know what to do with myself. People in, when I was younger made a lot of fun of me for that. They made fun of me for not having my own ambitions and my own motives. They laughed at me and called me other-directed. Well, but I just don't see any reason to live for just brain out, to get something brain out wants. But even God himself is, is, you know, begging that question. Okay, so I don't know if you have the same problem I do. Maybe you don't. Maybe your problem is something else. But there will be a hickey in your relationship view to, of yourself to yourself 
And this is going to center on that. You go back to square one. Why do you want to live? Why did you believe in Jesus Christ? Really? Nobody else has to know the answer to that but you. <clears throat> I mean, you know, you and the 2,000 angels probably standing over you, you can't see. And of course, God knows the answer to that question. But even Abraham didn't know. Until God sent him up the mountain, Abraham really didn't know if he'd go that far. Same thing with Gideon, David. All the Bible heroes hit their moments of truth with respect to their relationship to themselves. Now, my pastor has a name for this that's in the latter stages of maturity. He calls it evidence testing. And he says, basically, evidence testing is on two themes. Relationship to God and relationship to life. And it's answering those two fundamental questions in your own soul. Well, where do those two intersect? Your relationship to God intersects with, well, why do you want one? <clears throat> your relationship to life intersects with, well, what do you want out of life? And I actually don't know the answer to those questions. I mean, this is, this, if you ask me this question, it's like, Decaf or regular, you know, the Starbucks commercial where the person's eyes glaze over, they're standing looking at the big board behind the, the counter clerk. This is decaf or regular. And the counter and the person just eyes glazed over, can't make up the mind. You say, Well what does Brainout want out of life? I don't know. I actually don't want anything. I honestly don't. I've been passive my whole life. The only thing in life that I care about is knowing God. Well, but God isn't going to just let me sit there with a p sort of passive like he tells me what to do and I do it. He doesn't want that. I have to think through what I want. Because why? Because I'm training to be a king. And my polity is going to be the product of my own thinking. Just like we're a product of Christ's thinking. It's not passive. It's just like your parents kick you out of the nest after a while. You know, it gets real comfortable to be a child. And your parents tell you what to do. They set certain rules. And you get real comfortable with that. You don't have to think for yourself. And what do you want? And how do you craft your own life? I would have been quite content to have gotten married at some point in my life. But, you know, there was this problem of God being too interesting to me. And he never introduced me to some guy. Now I'm 60 years old, it's too late, as far as I know. And now it's like, well, what does Brain Out want? Why is Brain Out pursuing the spiritual life? Same question can be said to you. Why are you in this? Why are you listening to this audio? You're obviously interested in God. Okay, so what do you want out of it? What do you want out of the relationship to God and what do you want out of the relationship to life? You have to make those decisions. And that's all going to boil down to, well, what is it about knowing God that motivates you? What do you want that to mean? Because relationship to God will solve the relationship to life question. Because obviously the relationship to life is an expression of the relationship to God. But what should that be? And that's actually the question that you are faced with from the very first moment you believe in Christ. You're faced with it every day, all day long. You're faced with it when you go to sleep at night. You're faced with it when you wake up in the morning, whether you're a spiritual baby or spiritually mature. So notice how all these nuances in the trial, in the Satan argument, and knowing all these vocabulary words, in Hebrew and Greek, and oh, I know the Bible backwards and forwards, or however well you know it. In the final analysis, it's almost as if that stuff doesn't matter. Because you could know, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, you know everything. And without love... What's it worth? Nothing. Now, the word love in that passage means scripture. He's making a play on words that he started in 1 Corinthians 12, 31 in Greek with a head, you know, getting his head into our heads. That's what the whole book of Corinthians is about. But 
How much do you love... Being. Being in the relationship. What do you want? You, personally, want. That's going to ground you in all of your other decisions. And when my pastor was explaining this the first time, he, he called it, the, the first time this becomes a front and center issue, that, that you can actually deal with and grapple with it, is that spiritual adulthood, which most Christians never find out what that is. And that's when you start to love God. Okay? And what God wants, what God thinks, His perspective, His desire, you actually start to know that. God, instead of just being words in a book, the Bible is, this, is, is sort of reified into an actual uh, person you can see and know inside your head because you've got enough of his thinking inside your head so that you can see him as he is, as he thinks. Not full strength, but the, the, the gist is there. You share enough of his thinking that you actually can see him in your head as a person, as a live thinking person, what his own views are and his own ideas are and all the rest of it. And it starts with the Father, then it progresses toward the Son. Between the two, there's a, a development of what my pastor liked to call impersonal love for the human race. When he says impersonal, it doesn't mean cold. It means that it's not based on any attractiveness in the person who's the object. Okay, so the people are sort of in the middle. It starts with personal love for Father, then in the middle, there's this sort of honor love, is really be a good way of t translating it. And then um, you're occupied with Christ, and just before occupation with Christ, there's a, a total happiness on the inside of your own soul. Doesn't mean you feel good. Happiness is not feeling good. Happiness is knowing that you got the answers, knowing that you know what everything is. You know, there's a tension and an unhappiness and a misery that comes from always being uncertain. And along the way, you develop total certainty about what the facts are. It doesn't mean you know everything, but you have a total... It's really kind of hard to explain. I don't just believe in God. I know God. I actually know Him. In fact, I know Him better than I know me. I have to look at Him in order to know myself. And there's a total certainty about that. And I, you know, just... I, I'm looking at a piece of red luggage right now while I talk in this video. I'm absolutely certain that that's what I'm doing. Okay, and I'm just as certain that I, I know God. Sometimes I wish I didn't. Sometimes I run away from Him. Often, in fact. But even when I run away from Him, I know who He is. And David talked a lot about that. If I run down to Sheol, you're there. In other words, you can't run away from God. Yeah, especially if you know him. So why do you get up in the morning? What do you want out of life? What do you want in the relationship with God? What do you want in the relationship with life? And beginning in adulthood, those questions start to become, you know, front and center, but it really gets focused first on the character and nature of the person. And you're no longer studying Bible because it's the right thing to do. You're studying it to learn more about this person that you're beginning to know. And then it progresses and it gets more intimate and you, you have more spokes and, uh, to, the, to the understanding of him. You see him better. And it gets deeper and deeper and wider and, you know, the four dimensions in uh, Ephesians 3. Latter half of Ephesians 3. So, in this war, in this independence in this role playing and you keep coming back to basics this was a big surprise for me because I thought that the advanced stage of the spiritual life would be this you know arcane sophisticated thing no it's a base you're going all the way back to basics just like Greek drama Greek drama takes place over a day it starts at the beginning of the day and it ends at the end of the day. Then you have all these flashbacks and flash forwards to show you the importance of that day, which is exactly how Revelation is written, based on that theme of Greek drama.
It's based on Aristotle's poetics. And that's the way it is in your life, too. When you finally get to truly advance the, you know, maturity, at least an understanding, the issues go back to basics. Why do you believe in Christ? Why do you get up in the morning? What does God mean to you? Do you want God or not? And instead of all these sophisticated uses of all the sophisticated information that you've got about him by this point, you're basically operating as if you were five years old. When you're five years old, you have no knowledge at all, and it's, I just love mommy and mommy says so. And you don't have any knowledge to back that up. Well, when you're mature too, it's about like that. Except you have the knowledge to back it up. But your motive is just as basic. He's God, I'm not, that's all I know. He's God, I choose him, that's all I know. Like Job said, I know in my flesh I will see God. Job obviously had a real sophisticated knowledge of God and the rules and, you know, everything. Because when you hear him talk, you can tell. And he understood everything that his three verbose friends had to say. He could discern that what they were saying was gibberish. They were just flapping their gums. Eloquently, but they were flapping their gums. So he had a lot of sophisticated knowledge, but he doesn't express it that way. I know in my flesh I'll see God. God shows up, doesn't answer his question, and Job says, I repent in dust and ashes. No fancy speech, no display of all this sophisticated knowledge. you God, I'm not. That's all I care about. So don't be surprised when you start get, getting to this point, however long or short it's going to take you, that you come all the way back because you're going to think that like you're childish or something. You know, didn't I settle these things when I was five years old spiritually? I want God. Now all of a sudden I'm, 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 I'm flattened. I'm weak. And I just want him. That's all I know. No. It's as if you never learned any scripture. Because it doesn't matter how much you do know. See, in the beginning, it's do you want God despite your ignorance. At the end, it's do you want God despite what you know. And it's always just the simple, you want God or not. That's the number one weapon in this war. But you're not going to think of it that way. And it's full circle for all the sophistication and practice and all the stuff we've been talking about. It just comes back to, yes, I want God. No, I don't. Yes, I want to know you better. No, I don't. This is what I want out of my relationship to you. This is what I want out of my relationship to life. Because I just do. Right, wrong, or indifferent. I want this, I don't want that. So now you're choosing based on knowledge, whereas in the beginning of your spiritual life, you're choosing based on ignorance. It's a lot harder to choose based on knowledge. Because now you know all the, the, the pitfalls. You know, the soldier who goes running into battle and he has absolutely no clue what battle is like. He's going to have all kinds of enthusiasm and yeah, it's a big deal that he's willing to fight. But the soldier who rushes into the Valley of the 300, knowing full well what how that's going to feel, how it's going to hurt and the sweat and the hurry up and wait and all the things that are involved, that's a lot harder to run in even though you've gotten used to it because you know the dangers that await you know how hard it is but it's still the same action it's still the same motive so here armed with all this role playing and everything that you're doing that helps you be competent and get all the 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 how do you want to call it? The understanding. But in all events, the motive is just plain simple. I want God, I don't. Here's why. Here's what I want. And I want it. 
So you're, forced, you're, you're emphasizing yourself. That will relate and tie everything that you're learning and all the skills and the role playing and the trial and everything will unite it to your own, anchor it to your own motive that you yourself have for doing this. Because in the final analysis, that's what turns the tide. In the final analysis, the Christian who quits the spiritual life and goes in for substitutes like religion is doing it because he doesn't want God. It's too, it's too intense, really. And the few Christians who actually stick it through, this is why they do. Christ wanted Father. He wanted the oneness. Period. Over and out. He says so in John 17. We know what his motive was. Because he wanted that unity with Father, and, you know, pain for our sins was the only way to get it, structurally, because he's got a human soul, and he'd have to avoid sin, and Father would have to impute it to him. That's what he got for it. That's why he wanted it. And he wanted it for us, too. But we weren't number one motive for him. Number one motive for him was him and Father. Doing it for Father. For Father or forget it. And if that becomes your number one motive, you'll make it. Just, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. Yes, this is my motive. Is that my motive? Do I just want God or am I fooling myself? And if you're fooling yourself, admit you're fooling yourself. And then, you know, have a long talk with yourself about what motive you really want to have and be honest. Don't waste your time. If you don't want God, go away. Until you do. Because if you're punishing yourself by going forward, you're going to associate punishment with wanting God, and then you'll go away longer and harder. So do you want God or not? Do you want God or not? Do you want God or not? You see how, see that? Each word has its own emphasis in the sentence to complete the sentence. And anchor in that. If you're going to really role play, and I don't know the role play is the right word here, just keep remind, just keep asking yourself, why am I doing this? And be honest with the answer. And then you'll go wherever you go with it. Peace out.